Welcome to everyone and thank you for joining us for this presentation on green burials brought to you by the Centre for Inquiry Canada and the Ontario Humanist Society. I'm Shauna Watson, Vice President of Centre for Inquiry Canada. Just have a couple announcements before we get started. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we call home. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis and First Nations peoples. We also acknowledge that not all people came here as migrants and settlers, recognizing those who were brought involuntarily as enslaved people or by means of human trafficking, and we pay tribute to those ancestors and to their descendants. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improve relationships between nations, peoples and cultures, to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and consider how which we can each try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. In the interest of widely disseminating information, such as the topic of today's talk, we're not requiring payment or even membership to attend. We think this sort of information is important for everyone. CFIC is an educational charity promoting human rights, science, and critical thinking. In order to support this work, our operation relies on funds from memberships and donations. If you can help even a little, please visit our website at the URL, which I'll post in the chat window. All donations are tax deductible. I'll note that this talk is being recorded for publication on CFIC's YouTube channel and also the other channels that I noted. If this is a concern for you, please turn off your video. You're also welcome to replace your name with a pseudonym. Following the talk, we'll be accepting written questions using the Zoom chat feature, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom window. Please keep your questions short and to the point. We've enabled access for everyone to use the Zoom chat. Um, and also to post if you're having any technical issues. In all cases, we expect participants to be respectful of the speakers and also of other audience members. Before I introduce our main speaker, I've asked Kerry Bowser of the Ontario Humanist Society to say a few words. Kerry, please go ahead. Thank you, Sienna. Well, my name is Kerry Bowser. I'm the uh, president of the Ontario Humanist Society board. And uh, just in case you don't know uh, who we are, the Ontario Humanist Society was established in 2009, recognizing that we had an opportunity to create a, a province-wide community of humanists. So the mission of um, OHS, Ontario Humanist Society, is to practice and foster humanism specifically at the provincial level by providing focus, service, and a sense of ethical identity to humanists and humanist associations across Ontario in a manner consistent with humanist principles, practice, and core values. And so we adhere to the Humanist Manifesto, the Amsterdam Declaration, and the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Since Ontario, uh, as a province, allows for non-religious organizations like the Ontario Humanist Society to perform non-religious uh, wedding ceremonies um, specifically, the Ontario Humanist Society has been approved by the provincial government to license and train wedding officiants. And uh, I have to say that OHS is proud to have developed what we think is one of the most comprehensive efficient training programs that is currently being used as a model for Humanists International. So the training program that OHS provides is not only for weddings, but for all of life celebrations, including end of life celebrations, uh, uh, baby naming celebrations, and uh, even some boat naming celebrations that have been done. So we do welcome you to check us out. It's at uh, ontariohumanists.ca. And if you're interested in our humanist um, officiants program, we would uh, encourage you to check that out as well. You can find that information on our website. Thank you, Carrie. Now I'm going to introduce you to our main speaker, Mary Nash. Mary is a member of Community Death Care Ottawa and has followed developments in alternative funeral options, including green burials, since the early 2000s. 
In addition to a general involvement in alternative funeral options, Nash was a founding member of the Funeral Cooperative of Ottawa and also Green Burial Coordination Coordinator for the Federation of Ontario Memorial Societies. Welcome, Mary. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, hopefully. Uh, That's working. It's working. Okay. Participants can now see my application, but maybe I'll just move it over to, I have two screens so I can play with it. So everybody can see that Green Burial, Ottawa Valley. It's looking good. Okay, great. So um, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, have, I have Joan Harrison to thank for the invitation, I think, because uh, Joan and I are our friends through a dance community. And uh, one day she said to me, what have you been doing lately? And I said, well, um, I've been concentrating on my three passions, which are music, art, and funerals. And usually when I say that to people, it gets a reaction, which I'm glad of because I want people to know about funeral, talk about funerals and be specific about green funerals. Um, so here I am. Uh, first of all, a disclaimer, I am not a funeral director and I am not professionally associated with any funeral establishment or cemetery, but I have been working as a volunteer on getting green burial into Ottawa since 2006, and we have not achieved that yet. So today I will discuss natural or green burial, but also other means of disposition and how we get from those dispositions to green burial. So here we go. So the spectrum of dispositions are, first of all, you could start at one end with full body earth burial, then you go on to what most people just call cremation, but I like to call flame cremation because there are now um, other types of cremation cropping up, such as water cremation, which is also called resumation, alkaline hydrolysis, or aquamation. And then we have cryomation, which also sometimes goes by the um, moniker of freeze drying, promessia, which is the the commercial term, and I have also recently heard it called dry cremation. There is terramation, which could also be called recomposition or natural organic reduction, and then we come back to green or natural burial. Only green burial or natural burial does not require massive specialized equipment or infrastructure, and as we'll see, during my presentation, everything else requires incredible machinery, which, you know, is not a good thing. So going down, oops, what am I? Uh, going down green, you might want to do this. And what is natural burial actually? Well, it is burying a body, an unembalmed body in a biodegradable casket or shroud burying without a vault, so decomposition can occur naturally. Above ground, the land is restored to its natural habitat and often individual tombstones are replaced with communal markers. Now, sometimes in, some, in the natural or green burial cemeteries, there are personal markers, but otherwise there are sort of at strategic points, there are, um, there are markers which are communal with many names on it. Um, in Ontario, we've had some, we have the bad distinction of having the highest cemetery fees in Canada. So before we had our recent election earlier this week, the Natural Burial Association had a campaign to, to hope that the next government would help us to lower the fees for natural burial grounds. Currently in Ontario, Ontario, we have 40% of each plot sale goes to a care and maintenance fund, whereas the national average for this is 13%. And a new cemetery operator's fee in Ontario is a whopping $165,000. In every other province but one, 
which is the one that, it, that deviates a bit is Saskatchewan, which is $10,000 per hectare, but in every other province, it is zero. So we, were, we will continue to influence the next government, the new government to uh, reduce these fees because it is a burden on cemetery operators and people who want to start new cemeteries. So I'm, I'm a founding, I'm a volunteer director of the Green Burial Association, oh, sorry, the Green Burial Ottawa Valley Cooperative. Uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about this group, which is based in the Ottawa Valley. Um, we were set up to, to specifically get a, a green burial ground going in Eastern Ontario. Now, the, the name Ottawa Valley is, sometimes a little bit problematic to decide what is the Ottawa Valley, but the Ottawa Valley stretches along the Ontario and Quebec border from Ottawa in the south and all the way up to the north shore of Lake Comiskaming, so that's some 500 kilometers. And the goals of our cooperative is to hopefully establish a green burial ground for residents of the valley within one of the six townships that are prominent in the valley and to use the Ottawa Valley site as a template for other green burial sites in eastern Ontario. How did the Green Burial Ottawa Valley Co-op get to be what it is today? In 2018 the idea was born because there was a young woman who was dying and she really really wanted a green funeral. However, there was nothing to be found. So um, the people associated at that time with the uh, Ottawa Valley, the Green Burial Ottawa Valley, were um, found out about a, a Catholic church which would be able to offer her a green burial. However, the young woman had to become a Catholic. So there was a great deal of uh, rigmarole for her to, in order to have her green burial. So that forced the Green Burial Ottawa Valley to be formed to, for the need of an earth-friendly burial ground open to everyone, regardless of religious affiliation. And that is actually part of the problem of starting a burial ground here in, around Ottawa, because very often when you try and persuade a, a, a existing burial ground to be um, a green burial ground, they will not let you in because you're, you're not a, a member of that congregation, you don't live in the right area, and you're not a member of any uh, association that is associated with that particular burial ground. So we've been talking with one particular township in the Ottawa Valley for as a possible partnership. We have some um, Oops, sorry. We have and we have some leads on a couple of um, acres of burial ground, which uh, we possibly could use. But the principal problem is money. So, who are the board members of the uh, Green Burial Ottawa Valley? Well, Megan Spencer is an artist, and she's our president. We have two gentlemen on the board and we have six women on the board. So we're all of different persuasions. A lot of them are living in the upper Ottawa Valley and they have actually, um, they're, they're, I could say back to the landers, but they're, they're practical back to the landers and have done a great deal of work in various uh, public and social uh, media endeavors. So there's some more members. I myself am a retired information management consultant. And as I said, I have three principal passions and one of which is to keep a close eye on the funeral industry. Okay. So there is a, a schematic of one of the, of the particular burial ground that we are looking at. And so there's an overlay of one design that we could have for our burial ground. And that one design is, is fairly simplistic and it's fairly sort of um, plain Jane. And these, these particular um, 
the, these particular schematics were developed by Mark Richardson, who runs the Niagara Falls Green Burial Ground. And here's another one, and it's a little bit more imaginative with uh, several blocks of graves and a path meandering through the property. And we think maybe that's what, yeah, what we might want, but we're a long way from actually being able to achieve that. So what can you do? Well, those of you who are, are in the Ottawa Valley area, you can become a member of the Green Burial Ottawa Valley Co-op. And you can work with your local funeral homes to ask about green burials because at one particular prominent burial ground here in Ottawa, I said, why do you not have green burial? And they said, nobody has asked for it. It's a kind of chicken and egg situation. Um, in Ottawa, we have the particular problem that uh, the burial grounds in Ottawa are, are privately owned or are charitable organizations um, or religious affiliations. And the municipality of Ottawa Carleton has very little to do with burial grounds. So we can't really rattle the cages of our politicians. But you might be able to do so if you, uh, if you if you're in a different area. I actually would like to know how many people are uh, that I'm speaking to today are sort of uh, not in the Ottawa Valley. So we might be able to uh, sort of get a hold of that information in a little while. Um, oops, oops. Oh, somebody raised their hand. What is it? There's a problem. Oh, no, it was uh, just to say I'm not in the Al uh, Ottawa oh, Valley. Oh, you're not in the Ottawa Valley. Perhaps yeah, you could I thought, put it I in. I thought it was uh, show the hands thing who's not Oh, the... right. Perhaps you could, I can't see that at the moment. So perhaps you could put it in the chat and tell yeah. me where you're from. And, and other people could do the same thing because I'm quite interested in knowing uh, what the extent of, of my, uh, my audience is. And of course, this is a different kind of audience and it would be a, a live audience. Okay. So become a member, and if you become a member, the life, lifetime membership of our organization is only $20 per person. We would help you to stay informed on what our co-op is doing. You would have a voice in our organization. You might even want to become a board member. So below here is our website and our email address for becoming a member. Um, on our website as well, we have lots and lots of good articles and a, and a few pointers to some organizations. Now in Canada, we have the Natural Burial Association, um, which actually just covers Ontario and envisions green burial grounds all across Ontario and helps the communities to make this dream a reality. Uh, we have the Green Burial Society of Canada, which is a leading Canadian organization and they do the accreditation for green burial grounds. They set up certain standards and um, they decide that, um, you know, whether or not you deserve their sort of seal of approval. In the US, we have the Green Burial Council. And there are articles on Wikipedia about natural burial. Um, and there are lots and lots of other um, articles and uh, studies that have been done on green burial on various aspects of uh, green burial that that you could look up. There's also the most of these that I'm presenting here are on our website, which is just simply greenburialottawavalley.ca. So we will first discuss um, the traditional full body earth burial, which has been going on for quite a while. Um, this is terribly un environmentally unfriendly. Um, it has significant problems. Um, carb it's carbon intensive, it uses lots of resources and produces a lot of waste. What people sometimes want is embalming which is a preservation of the body for a short time. It's mostly used for open casket viewings. And if a funeral director can persuade you to have an embalming, well, they earn an extra fee. 
Um, embalming usually is not required by law and doesn't prevent the spread of disease. And as I said before, it doesn't generally preserve a body for very long. And th throughout the rest of the world, other than North America, it is not routinely practiced. And some populations such as Orthodox Jews and Muslims don't practice it at all. In addition, there are severe health risks for funeral home workers who have to do embalming. And the statistics are showing 13 higher death, 13 percent higher death rate for embalmers from one from the um, CDC, eight times higher risk of contracting leukemia, and three times higher risk of contracting ALS and other auto, autoimmune and neurological diseases. There are about two million caskets being produced in the U.S. every year. 75% of these are metal and often use toxic finishes. They'll have, they'll be, I have watched them in various factories being spray painted in sort of weird ways. And then of course you have a wooden casket, which wooden caskets over the, the year use up about 45 million board feet of very, very good and precious hardwood such as oak, maple, and charity. And then in certain, cemeteries, you have concrete vaults that are required by the cemeteries to be used to keep the ground level for their grounds maintenance. And again, you have a great um, need then for about 1.6 tons of concrete. And the manufacture and the transporting of the concrete vaults is very carbon intensive, of course. Um, <clears throat> a burial in Canada so you got more ecological problems of conventional burials. You have to have extensive and intensive grounds maintenance with lots of water. People put on fertilizers, pesticides, and use lots of equipment, more mowers, diggers for the graves, um, all kinds of uh, all kinds of various pieces of equipment. And on a, on a typical 10 acre conventional cemetery, there's enough casket wood to build 40 plus houses, 900 plus tons of casket steel, 20,000 tons of vault concrete and enough formaldehyde to fill a small swimming pool. Now people will, will have different ways of evaluating these things. So you'll find different statistics all the way through if you're looking at the, uh, at, on the web. There's granite for the headstones. It's energy intensive to produce, the, to mine the granite, to produce it, and then you have to transport it and you have to engrave it. So here are just some, some more um, figures of what the ecological problems are with conventional burials. We have about 200, uh, 20,000 cemeteries in the US and they're burying about a million gallons of formaldehyde, about 100,000 tons of steel, which would be enough to build another Golden Gate Bridge, for instance. Um, there's lots of tons of copper and bronze for more caskets, um, 30 million board feet of hardwood and about 1.6 million tons of concrete. So we have to think of different things. So one of the alternatives that has been touted for quite a while is flame cremation. Most people just call it cremation, but because there are now different kinds of cremation, I prefer to use the term flame cremation. And it's a popular method of disposition. In Canada, about 70% of uh, people are using flame, are, asking for flame cremation, partly because they don't know what other methods of disposition might be available. But flame cremation has toxic emissions. It's burning at high temperatures for extensive periods of time. One cremation releases about 400 kilograms or a thousand pounds of carbon into the atmosphere. And that's not the end point. After burning, the bones need to be pulverized into a powder. And then of course, you're going to be asked, would you like a suitable container to put the cremations, the cremate, what they call cremains, put the cremains in. 
And actually, I one time asked a funeral director here in town when they were having one of their, we would like you to know more about funeral seminars. I said, what if I went to the dollar store and had an attractive little box or vase or something? They said, that's perfectly okay. So remember that when you want to get a good, uh, good container, go to a dollar store. Um, the cremation typically in Canada costs about $2,000 to $5,000. But of course, it, it, uh, as I said before, um, it has environmental impacts and lots and lots of chemicals are being given off and some faiths actually prohibit it. Um, the Jewish tradition is against embalming and flame cremation. Catholics weren't allowed to be cremated until 1963, which is around the time of the Second Vatican Council. And the, the allowed sort of the regulations were further updated in 1997. Then we come to water cremation, which is also called, can be called resumation. You'll hear it called hydro, hydro, alkaline hydrolysis or aquamation. And aquamation basically means that you are put into a tube, there is water added, and there's a, about a four or five percent solu alkaline solution is put in. And then you, the body is dissolved over a matter of hours within, a, within this cylinder. Aquamation is legal in Ontario now, Quebec, Saskatchewan, and nearly two dozen American states, but not in BC. The bones are ground up after the, after the process and put into an urn, so that that's no different than flame cremation. The process produces a liquid effluent said to be safe for disposal in local wastewater streams. It has two levels of temperature. There's a high temperature water cremation, which takes about six hours at about 177 degrees centigrade. And the cost of that machine is $350,000. So there's a significant investment that has to be made. In Ontario, they're only allowed to do high temperature cremation because the, the um, bereavement authority of Ontario is terribly concerned that, you know, things will not go right. So you'll, you'll just do it at a high temperature. Low temperature acclimation takes about 18 hours at about 93 degrees centigrade. The cost of, of that machinery is about $100,000 less. And as I said, only high temperature is currently allowed in Ontario. The ash that comes off is about 20 to 30% more than in a flame cremation. So here we have the comparisons between flame cremation and aquamation as to what the after effects are of, um, of the the implements or the medical implements that are coming off. In a flame cremation, the medical implements that are not removed are just totally destroyed. In aquamation, they can be saved and they can be recycled. So, and I've actually seen this, I've actually, uh, there, there used to be close to Ottawa, there used to be somebody who was doing aquamation and he actually, um, he didn't exactly invite us to come, but we persuaded him that we were okay. We were not going to complain that people were, uh, that he was doing anything wrong because he was being hounded by the, um, the bereavement authority of Ontario. So, and he actually showed us the, the pacemakers and all kinds of things that, that would be able to be recycled. In the remain stage, you have quite a lot of ash and you have about 20 to 30% more ash when it comes to acclimation. So one of the problems that a recent funeral director mentioned is that they have a problem with the size of the urns that are available. The, um, the urns are not big enough. So that's a small problem to have really. Um, a Dutch researcher called Elizabeth Kaiser did a study for an organization in Holland 
uh, twice actually. She did one in 2011 and she did a, an update in 2014. And she decided that there was the comparison between a burial, uh, a cremation and alkaline hydrolysis was such that they developed something called a shadow price. And the shadow price for each method is the lowest amount of money it would theoretically cost to either compensate for the environmental impact or avert the environmental impact. So here you see that the burial, the actual body burial is about 63 euros. The cremation is about, um, is 48 euros. And the alkaline hydrolysis is very much lower at two and a half euros. So it's, a, it's quite an interesting comparison. Some people would probably dispute this, but um, on a sort of um, principle basis, it's not a bad comparison to have. I then decided to look at the cost of acclimation. There are four principal funeral homes in Ontario that are allowed to do it. And as all funeral homes have to, have to put forth their price lists, I decided to do a comparison. So there's the comparison. Um, the first one is Establishment A, Newcastle Funeral Home in Newcastle, Ontario, just east of Toronto, comes in at about 2000. So, and let me tell you, it is very, very difficult to do comparisons between the various funeral homes because everybody calls a certain process something different and they lump things together differently. So it's very, very difficult to sometimes do the comparison. For the last, I had three of them done out. For the last one, the funeral director was just giving me a lump sum and I said, I want an itemized thing. And he actually, I sent him my table and he actually kindly did the the breakout of all the, the various different um, charges that they have for a particular for acclimation. So one of the funeral directors had something called a package discount. <laughs> and I I called him on this and I said, what is the package discount? Well, he said, I like to keep my cost of acclimation below $2,000. So I give everybody who does the acclimation, I give everybody a $205 discount. So another funeral director who, who knew about this, who of course, they're all, they're all, they all know what each other charges and looking at each other's prices. And so he said, well, he said, uh, I wish he wouldn't do this, but it's, it's done. So it's between 2000 and about 3,500 are the costs. And, but let me tell you, it's still pretty, pretty hard to uh, find out the, the uh, relative cost of these things. Then there's terramation, which is human composting or recomposition. So that's being done mostly in the Northwest of the US and in Colorado. So the process is allowed in Washington state, in Oregon and Colorado, but nowhere in Canada yet. So the, the various um, processes that it has to go through, one thing is called the laying in, and the laying in is the placing of the body on a bed of straw, alfalfa, and sometimes wood chips, or a combination um, in an insulated vessel. And here you see the insulated vessel. It is air and water tight, and it's about three feet, three by three by seven feet. In this case, with the Natural Funeral Company, um, it's, called, it's called a chrysalis. And apparently it's completely reusable, and the contents smell like a spring garden. Um, the terramation process, the actual terramation process after, after the body is put in, is conducted at an internal temperature of 131 Fahrenheit for about for three different se sessions of 72 hours. They add oxygen. The total process could take about four to six months. At some point, the... Um, Things like artificial joints, stems, and screws are removed 
before the process goes in goes on. Then the process continues. Uh, the remaining bones at the end of the, the terramation process are broken down, similar to flame cremation, and returned to the vessel for a further sort of curing period. Um, one month before the laying out, which is actually giving back the fertilizer to the family or to farmers who want it, um, the curing, the, the bones are reduced and you get approximately a one cubic yard of fertilizer out of the process. The fertilizer is not used for edible crops, um, because, but it's not, but it, uh, it can be used for other things. People can use it for fertilizer in their gardens. Uh, the laying out is actually the giving back of the fertilizer to the families. And that is done um, in, in the case of the natural funerals, it's done in Lafayette, Colorado. It's this particular process is not suitable for deaths due to Ebola, TB or prion diseases. So this particular, the natural funeral company has this type of um, vessel. There are other types of vessels. Um, this one is from a company called Recompose and they call this bank of 10 containers a vessel array. So there are, there are about, um, there are different companies doing this and their, their um, charge ranges from about uh, $3,000 to about $8,000, depending on which company you choose. Then there's cryomation. And cryomation is not a process that actually has caught on. It was um, started to be developed in about 2010. And it's also called freeze drying. It comes out of Sweden. And what happens in this process that, that the body is actually frozen. So it starts with what they call coffin separation. The body is placed into a chamber, which is actually a cold chamber. And in this particular schematic, the coffin is shown at the top and it keeps being shown all the way through the process or part way through the process on the right. But actually after the body is removed from the coffin, the coffin basically could be reused, but the coffin is no longer involved in the process. So the body is cryogenically frozen in liquid nitrogen to about minus 200 degrees centigrade or 321 degrees Fahrenheit, takes about two hours. It is the remains are then vibrated. The body is disintegrated into particles within minutes. It's just the freezing process basically disintegrates the body. Then it is freeze dried. The particles are freeze dried in a drying chamber leaving approximately 30% of the original weight. The metal, again, metal has to be separated. So things like tooth amalgam, artificial hips, et cetera, are removed either by magnetism or by sieving. The dry powder is then placed in a small biodegradable casket, which you see over here. Um, the Promethean remains are then interred in the top layers of soil for about six to 12 months. And in the end, again, you get the, you get the fertilizer. So there's the method, there's the founder. Uh, she founded it in 2001. She herself actually passed away in 2020, but because it's not a process that is common, commonly used, she wasn't able to use the, the um, the process either in her disposition. Um, I found an excellent video on YouTube the other day. It's called, Can You Freeze Dry Your Corpse? In a series called Ask a Mortician by Caitlin Doty. Now, Caitlin is, she is a funeral director in California and she does a series of very interesting um, YouTube videos. And this particular one, if you're in doubt about why it's not working, why it isn't, widely, um, why it isn't widely used, you can find it in this video. It's only about 10 minutes long. 
So here we are back to natural or green burial, envisaging a tranquil park like setting, a place to visit, a place to possibly picnic and just sit around and think about life. You give back to the earth and you preserve the land for all people to enjoy. And why do people love the idea? Your final act is giving back to the earth. You're resting among nature. You're not polluting the earth like you would be in any of the other dispositions that we have discussed. It's going back to a traditional approach. It was what was doing, what was happening with our grandparents and with our grandparents' grandparents. And the, the actual, your presence is in the ground, the land is preserved forever. So there are the five principles of natural or green burial. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it means no embalming or flame cremation. The decomposition is nature's way of recycling the body. There's direct earth burial, no grave liners, no concrete vaults. You're in a shroud or a biodegradable container and the body goes directly into the ground. There's ecological restoration and conservation. You preserve the site and there's perpetual protection and this is a key, key component of this in Ontario because once a cemetery it, or a piece of land is a cemetery, it can never be used for anything else. You've got communal memorization. Sometimes you've got individual flagstone natural um, indicators, but ultimately you probably, mo most natural burial grounds are going towards communal memorialization and you're doing optimum use of the land. A well-planned natural burial ground will optimize the land that it occupies. So this is a schematic about how deep the coffin will be buried in a regular funeral, in a regular disposition with a regular burial, you're about five feet down. With a green burial, you are about three and a half feet down or maybe three feet even because the, the, the microbial activity that is needed to decompose a body is more active in the top layers of the soil. And this is one schematic that has made the, that has been around for ages and ages and everybody uses it. So here it is again. In Ontario, in Canada, we have three kinds of cemeteries. We have dedicated green cemeteries, we have hybrid cemeteries, or we have green friendly cemeteries, but the, 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 um, the Green Burial Society of Canada really only officially recognizes four in Ontario to date. So there's Fairview in Niagara Falls, there's Parkview in Waterloo, there's Coburg Union in Coburg, and Glenwood in Picton. Now, each one of these has particular requirements. For instance, Coburg will not, will not sell you an at need um, plot. You have to buy it in advance of your death. This is Glenwood Cemetery in Picton. <clears throat> Most people from, from the Ottawa region are now going to Glenwood. Um, it is about two and a half hours drive away from Ottawa, and uh, well, it's the one that is being used most most prominently right at the moment. So you can see how the body is wrapped in a shroud. Possibly this is this container. This looks like a sort of straw container or a fiber container that may or may not be um, may or not may or may not be recycled. This is one particular uh, burial site. And this is the one that Glenwood always likes to, to prominently display because it's, it's Judy's husband sitting by her grave saying that she wanted to be a tree and now she is going to be a tree. Um, there's some of the other ones in Canada. There are, is one in Denman Island in BC, but you have to be a resident of Denman Island to be able to be buried there. So as I said, each one has particular requirements. In the US, there are 
many, many green burial grounds. One of them, the most, the first U.S. natural burial ground established in 1996 was Ramsey Creek in South Carolina. And here's my hubby and my cousin I, Irene walking towards the chapel, which is on the grounds. Each one, each plot uh, at Ramsey Creek is signified by a uh, round field stone with, with a particular saying or some sort of printing on it that was requested by the family or by the person themselves. It has a little creek running through it. There are several places to sit with natural benches and they encourage picnics in the site. Here's the Carolina Memorial Sanctuary. And you can see here how deep or how shallow actually the grave is being dug. And it's in a natural fiber, sort of a wicker type um, container. One of the many UK examples is the South Down Natural Burial Site in Hampshire in the UK. And it's one of over 250. And there are probably more in the planning stages. And there's an example of a casket being carried down to a particular plot in, uh, in Petersfield, Hampshire in the UK. Now, <clears throat> the surprise, the glorious surprise is that in Eastern Ontario, the first natural burial ground is coming on stream later this year or early 2023. It will be located about an hour's drive from Ottawa. It will have 70 to 100 plots available for approximately $1,000 plus HST for internment rights, and it'll be on a next available space basis. And this may need a little bit of explanation. It is not that you actually decide on, a, on an actual spot and say, this is the spot where, as in Glenwood, you will be buried in the next available space that they have available. They will open up a sort of trench and maybe there'll be 10 spaces in a trench and then it'll be filled up in sequence. Um, this is the way they're going to do it at Elmwood. And so anybody in the Ottawa area who wishes, um, you know, keep posted, they will, they have a, um, an actual uh, newsletter. So if you, want to be informed, get onto their newsletter site. <clears throat> this ends my pre presentation basically. And uh, I want to thank the, the local authority folk in Grantham in Lincolnshire for actually causing a little bit of a joke there. And now we're opening for questions. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, so uh, yeah, we have we have a few questions. I'm I'm going to uh, um, post into the uh, chat if people are interested in um, in uh, <clears throat> finding out more about the Green Burial Ottawa Valley um, or joining. I've I've posted a, a link to the website, and um, now uh, we have a few questions that have come in already. But um, um, by all means, please uh, put your questions in, in the chat. And I know a lot of stuff has come in. So um, I, if I've missed your question, um, please uh, feel free to post it again. Um, also, uh, you know, we have questions can either be put to, um, to Mary, um, or if you have questions about um, uh, humanist efficiency, you can also ask Carrie. Um, and so, uh, so uh, one question that came in um, is um, from Anne Bossy in Quebec. You don't have to be embalmed. Um, you a few funeral homes will allow the purchase of a plain pine box. Is this still considered green? Uh, <clears throat> as long as you're not embalmed, it's considered green. And the plain pine box is fine. It's bio, It's hopefully biodegradable. But if it isn't biodegradable, then you're better not to use it. OK, thank you. Um, a question, why, why can't a green burial just have the naked cadaver? Why is a casket or sh shroud required at all? Well, that's a good question. And uh, really, uh, well, I, I think it probably has to do with, with aesthetic, aesthetics. Uh, 
you know, it's, it's, it might eventually come to the fact that you could be deposited into the ground without anything at all, without a shroud, without a biodegradable box or whatever. But at the moment, it's a step forward to get away from the, uh, from the metal casket, from the concrete vault, um, anything else that, that people want or that cemeteries would want. It's not so much people. And yeah, and somebody says, shrouds go over. Well, you, you can get a cotton shroud. You can go and get a cotton sheet. You do not necessarily have to buy a tailor-made shroud. So, because, you know, people who are in business about the shrouds, the coffins, um, you know, you can, uh, you, can, you can make a business out of anything. So. Thank you. Okay, we have, we have a question about um, donating your body to science. Um, I, I guess also donating your organs. Um, uh, is, is that a, a green option? And do you, can you say anything about those options? Well, it's, I think certainly it's, it's a green option. Uh, it, it happens before the actual burial. Um, I think that the hospitals or medical schools that have that will accept bodies have particular ways of disposition of the bodies after those bodies have been used. You may be able to the family may be able to negotiate with the hospital or the, the medical school as to the method of disposition in the end. Um, but but you may have to remember with body donate with, with body donation is that I think nowadays not all medical schools want all the bodies that they may be offered because people have different methods of for the students to learn they learn through models rather than the actual bodies so the, the donation of the bodies these days is is a little bit. Um, not you know not particularly clear in most cases it, it's dependent on on the need and the, the time when the body is being donated thank you um one, one thing actually i i'll note about just this just from my personal experience um we've been talking mostly about um, um human remains um but i know a number of us have had to deal with um remains of of uh, um pets and uh, something that I found out recently um, that is not widely known um, is that uh, um, some veterinary schools will accept uh, um, remains of, of uh, pets um, that have uh, died naturally or been euthanized. And uh, so people may yeah. be interested to know about that. I, I certainly found that in the Ottawa area. We recently donated a pet to the Algonquin Vet Tech program, so. Oh, good. Well. You know, there's all kinds of possibilities that you find out about when the need arises. Exactly. Um, Carrie, you had a comment. I was just going to say uh, I, I have done uh, services in the past uh, for people who have um, donated their bodies to the science. And it can take um, as long as the, the family is prepared for, you know, not to have the um, remains um, delivered back to them. In some time, in some cases, it has been for a couple of years, um, and, and my experience has been that the that where you know if it's the hospital or wherever the the body has been donated, they they tend to have their own process. Uh, so you may be able to negotiate with them, but they have a tendency to um, uh, present the, um, the the remains, usually cremated, to the family for them to. Um, uh, to either um, uh, scatter, dispose of as they choose. Mm. Oh, that's interesting to know. But I think these days it's um, fewer bodies are being accepted for donation because of um, you know plastic models and other ways of educating the medical students. We had one question come in about uh, um, if there's a place where you could uh, um, buy um, or ways of making a, a wicker uh, container. Um, well, there is a local, well, there's a local casket maker called Earthbound Coffins that you can go to, but I am not particularly sure about the, the wicker containers. And I think it might be just a, 
It might be more prominent to have a wicker container in Britain. I have not heard about wicker containers so much in Canada. Um, one thing that you could do is to buy a cardboard box. And what lots of families do is to have people who are attending the funeral or attending the wake to decorate this particular, this cardboard box with letters, flowers, drawings, etc. So, but yes, that's, a, that's an interesting question that I will look into about where you could get wicker wicker caskets because actually there's more and more fake wicker being produced these days so the tendency is uh, not to have so much natural wicker behind uh, around okay that's an interesting area to explore I don't see any more questions. Um, did anybody else uh, write a question that I missed? If so, um, um, maybe you could just raise your hand um, and let me know. Uh, okay. Not, no, not that is not not allowed. You can scatter the ashes on a lake uh, or a pond or whatever. Um, Okay, was that a question directed to you, Mary? Because I didn't, I didn't see it. Uh, I saw, I saw it in the, I, actually in the chat, or oh, may, maybe, just, maybe just it, came up on the bottom of my screen. Okay, maybe it was uh, directly to you and not to everybody. Maybe. Okay, well, can you repeat the question then, please? Uh, well, I don't see the question anymore. Actually. Oh dear. Okay. <laughs> I know it. I know it had to actually. Do shrouds have a hard back? Uh, some sh okay, burial at sea or in a lake? Uh, the burial at sea, well, in, in Ontario, you have to be buried in a licensed cemetery. So I think no to the lake. The sea option, I don't know. Since Ontario is not uh, surrounded by sea, that, that particular problem hasn't come up, but whether you, whether you can, whether, you, you know, if you die on a cruise, yeah, a Viking burial, well, maybe it, I've actually inquired about being buried in my own backyard because I feel my backyard is my property, but um, I asked it of the city of Ottawa and they never really answered me. And I have a feeling that it was a matter of just sticking their head in the sand. <laughs> So, okay, Carrie, yeah, uh, Carrie, think, Carrie, go ahead. Yeah, so I was just going to say it is legal to scatter remains on Crown land anywhere mm -hmm. in Canada. So, yeah, um, when you get to the ash stage, but if you don't ever want yes. to get to the ash stage, then yeah, then it's more, you know, much more difficult. then it's it's a moot point. I think we have now run through um, all the questions. And Somebody so- Somebody has a comment. See the movie, what I did. Just a comment. What I did on my summer holiday. Oh yes, I've seen that movie. <laughs> and that, that involves a, a, a Viking burial actually. Okay. And yes, and as uh, um Steve notes in the chat that uh, um, we have uh, scattered ashes um, in, in a provincial park. And uh, you can also, but, but again, you have to get to the ash stage and if that's what we're trying to avoid. Uh, exactly, so. yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, thank you very much uh, um, to, uh, to Mary and, and to Carrie for, uh, um, and thanks to everybody who asked thoughtful questions and uh, um, if you if you want more information I have posted the link uh, to the Green Burial Ottawa Valley and also to Ottawa Humanists in the chat and uh, that will also be available uh, if people want to watch the video again again um, the video will be available probably in a few weeks in case uh, you've missed a part or you want to share it with somebody else um, 
So, um, Mary or Carrie, did you have anything else you wanted to add before we close? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Well, thanks again. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming. Just a few closing okay. remarks. Um, we require entirely on donations and memberships and Center for Inquiry so that we can continue to bring you events such as this. Uh, so we ask you if you can visit our website or email us for more information about how to become a member, make a donation, be a volunteer, any of those things. Because of the limitations of Zoom, we can't properly applaud, but I invite everyone to try to use the technology. You, if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen, you can see a reactions tab on which you can find a clap icon, and then you can show your appreciation with a virtual clap. Okay. We have many other events and presentations. If you want announcements about what's coming up, we invite you to join our virtual branch. Uh, I posted the link in the chat. So if you want to check out what we have, we have uh, weekly video um, presentations. We have discussion groups. We have a living without religion group. We have many, many opportunities for people to get to get together virtually. And coming up, we're also having more opportunities for people to actually get together physically. Uh, what a change. So again, thanks to everybody for coming and uh, look forward to seeing you again.